There we go. So the README is in the uh, Slack channel if you want to take a look. I'll share my screen if you want to follow along and answer any questions you have. And then my fellow instructors, if you have any, um, just pop in if I'm forgetting something or if you have anything to add. So I'm going to share my screen. And here we go. So like I said before the break, um, one of the kind of the things that you're going to work on throughout the course is a portfolio site. So we want to get you guys ramped up early, um, partly to make Eric and Seth happy and partly to give you guys an opportunity to practice your HTML and CSS foo, some of the stuff that we went over this week. <clears throat> so hopefully this will be a fun, creative visual experience for you over the weekend. And uh, there shouldn't be as much uh, intensive logic as there was in your uh, game project over the holidays. That being said, we would encourage you to the extent that you feel like it's appropriate to try to throw in some JavaScript if you want to get some practice with that, if you want some click events or some hovers or something. Um, but mainly this is an opportunity for you to stretch your, stretch your CSS, uh, your legs and such. Okay, your personal portfolio page. Um, I'll do a little bit of a screenshot and put it into Slack as we go through it. Um, I'm not going to read every single line here in the interest of time, but if you guys have any questions, please, please speak up. So given what you've already learned about web development, there are probably many things you would change about the About Me page you completed while applying for WDI. So who is planning on using their About Me page for WDI like when you apply to, to be your portfolio site? Anyone? Did anyone have such a bad, badass page that they're going to use that for their... No? Okay. That's, that's, that's par for the course right there. Cool. Well, this is an opportunity to get a nice spanking new portfolio page working. So this weekend is an opportunity for you to make those changes. Um, and so instead of changing your existing site, we'd encourage you to build a new one from scratch. That's kind of the point of this exercise. So remember you have the rest of the course and the rest of your life to revise and upgrade this portfolio site that you'll start over the weekend. Now, like I mentioned before the break, as you go through this course, you're going to learn a lot of other technologies. By the end of the course, maybe you want to like build a quick and dirty portfolio site in Rails. Maybe you want to put some Angular on top of it. Um, maybe you want to add some sort of blogging component, which we would highly encourage you to do um, to blog about your experience in the course. But the point is this thing is dynamic and it's going to grow throughout the course. So don't feel like you're married to this thing that you build over the weekend. But we do want you to have a good foundation going forward. Okay, so part of this process, we want to encourage you to get into the habit of wireframing. So Colin mentioned how when you get out into the uh, real world and out of the GA nest, unfortunately, you don't always have the luxury of the measure twice, cut once, and proper wireframing, you know, perfect code syntax and best practices, um, a full test suite for your code. Uh, but this is an opportunity for you to get practice and really, you know, be thoughtful about the stuff that you want to build, and wireframing is part of that. So wireframing is a simple blueprint or template sketch visual outline of the components of your website. We saw several variants of these when you were presenting your uh, uh, holiday projects. Some of you guys built um, a wireframe on, you know, uh, maybe Mockingbird or some sort of online um, Solution and some of you, you know, drew out a wireframe, which is pretty awesome. I mean, there's really no wrong way to go just as long as it clearly conveys and communicates what you're trying to build. That's really the point. There's some great digital wireframing to tools out there. So if you haven't played around with an online wireframing tool, we would encourage you to try that, you know, just for funsies over the weekend. Um, they're pretty user friendly. The barrier barrier of entry is pretty low. And um, they're all pretty similar. So it would be a good experience to, you know, just build a wireframe with one of these digital tools. Uh, one that's listed here is Mockingbird. Uh, I know that some of you, it's not coming to my mind at the moment, but if you want to put other tools that you used to wireframe into Slack, that'd be super helpful. But wireframe is, excuse me, Mockingbird is just an example of a very, um, very easy to use interactive wireframe type of tool if you want to use that. There's also a link here, this README to Wireframe Basics. So just a little bit of information about maybe some guidelines as you think about your wireframes in a thoughtful way and such. So that's wireframing. We want to encourage you to take a stab at that. And that's actually something you could work on this afternoon. I mean, you could bang one of those out in probably you know, under an hour before we dismiss for the day if you wanted to. 
And again, if anyone else has any good wireframing resources that you would recommend, just pop those into the Slack channel. Any questions so far on those two sections? Okay, some things to consider, just some things to keep in mind. So think about who you want to view your site. So are these potential employers? Do you want to be more of a freelancer? Um, is it just for your friends, etc., family and friends? It's tempting to make your site very flashy, and we went through animation yesterday, and I think we'd all agree that a little goes a long way. So um, just sprinkling a little bit of animation in, I think is a really good, cool little polish, kind of icing on the cake thing. Um, but the most important thing overall when designing your site is to make it easy to use and easy for the visitors to access the information they want and to navigate around the page. Um, so you want the UI to be pretty clean and simple. Again, you're going to have a lot of time over the course as you get more savvy in this stuff if you want to add some complexity to the front end. But, uh, you know, try to keep in mind who you're creating the site for and you don't want to make it too difficult for them to um, access the information, your contact information, your LinkedIn, GitHub, et cetera. Think about the goal for your site and what you want your users to do. Is the point to read about your story, kind of your brand, to look at your work, code, writing, samples, your portfolio, if you will, uh, or is your contact information kind of the, the headline that you want, the most predominant thing in your site? Think about that and guide the user to taking those actions by making them prominent and easy to find. Again, just think about the UI, the user experience as they go through your site. And finally, potential employers will probably view your source code. So be sure to use proper indentation and organize your code, not only for this site, but for you know, all of your projects, obviously. By the time that you start interviewing, you definitely wanna make sure that you've polished up your GitHub fix some indentation issues, you know, comments, et cetera. Um, so just, just keep your house, you know, in order, keep it neat and tidy. Here's some example portfolios. Uh, I'm not gonna put those into Slack. I'm gonna encourage you guys, if you wanna click on those later at your own time, those are just five. They really run the gamut from super flashy and complex to very kind of uh, deceptively clean and simple, if that makes sense. Um, so I'll let you check those out. And uh, I'll go through this next section, and then if any of the other instructors would want to um, kind of walk through their process for their portfolio sites, we can get some insight into that. Finally, the bonus section, and this is not an exhaustive bonus section. There are a ton of other features and such that you could take a stab at adding to the site, but this is just a sprinkling. So this first bullet point, <clears throat> so consider creating an alternate visual theme for your site and create a button that uses JavaScript to toggle between themes. So what do I mean by that? Actually, for this one, I will uh, open this up so we can talk about it. Um, this is really fun. I think this is, um, yeah, this is one of our former instructors. Oh, he changed it. Oh, Robin updated his site. This is not party time anymore. That's a bummer. Maybe I can find the previous version of it. So he, our, our buddy Robin, uh, he had like a very polished, professional looking site. And then when you clicked on a button that's called party time, it went back to like 1990, a 1990s looking site where you had like stuff flashing, stuff moving across the screen. The font was just brutal. It was really funny. Um, that's a bummer. Uh, Jessica's is awesome. Yeah, I, this is really nice, actually. Uh, Audrey, do you know Jessica, or did you work with her? No, I haven't worked with her, but I was just going through the portfolios when you were talking about them and clicking on oh, the cool. stuff. So I was saying nice. his does, still does something, but in the top of hers, when you click the heart, like I thought it was pretty oh, awesome. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I thought it was pretty awesome how the different things kind of come up, and it's very easy to understand, and it just, it just was really well done in my eyes. So what... First of all, before we move forward, let me let me give you guys a caveat. I, I'll bet you whatever amount of money you want to bet, whatever. Uh, Jessica didn't do this like over a weekend. This is something she probably put a lot of time into. And it's something that grew organically as she grew as a web developer. So like first and foremost, this side is really banging. Don't feel like you're, you're going to crank this out by Monday. So don't try to compare what you're going to do to this. 
this is something that um, I, I would seriously be surprised if she just like banged this out in a few hours or over a weekend. So um, you can definitely get to this, but don't feel like this is what's expected by Monday. Uh, but really quick uh, review of some stuff we did. So when you click on this heart, it looks like there's another portion of the page that opens up at the top, like a little extra hidden nav area. Uh, put it into Slack or if you want to come on mic. So just about some ideas, if you wanted to recreate this, what would be a strategy or an approach to mimic this behavior? Anything that we've covered, JavaScript, CSS, -E. do you guys have any thoughts? Or which part? So when I click on this heart in the top right hand corner, like this extra kind of Easter eggy nav bar opens. It kind of looks like the toggle slide thing that we did this morning. Yeah, right? Yeah, maybe some sort of jQuery toggle on the heart. Or like the hamburger thing that we just did. Yeah, that's true. I wonder how responsive this is. Yeah, it looks really nice. Yeah, for sure. Um, just asking, you know, uh, yeah, some sort of click event, some sort of. It's so amazing. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> this is really, really nice. Very, um, what a great representation of who she is as a developer and such. Uh, just let me click on one of these selections. So this is like the really fancy blow you away site. And then if we clicked on, we'll check on, uh, click on teen girl mode. There we go. That's fun times. <laughs> so that's pretty cool, right? It's pretty clever. There's some, uh, is that my little pony there? I'm asking for a friend. I'm not sure. I uh, don't know much about that, but um, that's pretty fun. What else does she have? Swiss mode. Oh, okay. That still looks pretty good. <laughs> then field notes, kind of like a Wes Anderson-y feel there. Cool. So again, this is a really clever idea. It's kind of meta, right? She has all of her information. This is a very accessible, easy to uh, maneuver around uh, site, but she has like a really clever, creative approach to it. So um, yeah, that's, that's pretty fun. I am a brony. You're darn right I am. Okay, so if you want to check out these other example portfolios, please do. <clears throat> uh, so bonuses, excuse me. Uh, those were two examples of creating like an alternate theme. That's really kind of a clever. So maybe you want to create a theme like straight up CSS. Maybe you want to create another theme with Bootstrap or Flexbox or some other fancy CSS library. Maybe you want to create a theme um, that's pretty much the same HTML, right? And these um, alternate versions of the site, the HTML is the same. All they're doing is creating a new style sheet, essentially. So maybe you want to create a style sheet and go crazy, go nuts with all the animations and the, you know, backwards moonwalking cat and such, you know, maybe just for fun. Okay, bullet point number two. Uh, so this is really important, arguably the most important part of this whole deal, is we would like for you guys to deploy your site to GitHub pages. Now some of you did deploy your holiday uh, game project to GitHub pages, which is awesome. But we really can't emphasize enough how uh, slick and how convenient and uh, relatively easy GitHub pages is to work with. So if you haven't deployed something to GitHub pages, this is the first opportunity for us to do so. So we want you to deploy your site to GitHub pages. The links here, uh, their tutorial, their online documentation is really, really well done. So we'd encourage you to take a stab at deploying it yourself over the weekend. Um, if we have any issues, we'll address them on Monday. So you know, don't, don't lose too much sleep over it. But uh, would encourage you to take a stab at it. If you have any issues, maybe reach out to someone that has deployed to GitHub pages. Um, but it's a really handy tool and it's a really good practice to get into. Not only can you deploy your portfolio site, but any repo that you push to your repo um, that consists of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, you can immediately have like a public domain for it on your GitHub pages. Uh, it doesn't work with server side stuff. So anything dealing with like a database, it's not quite that um, robust, but it's really great to just get your work up there uh, in, a, in a short period of time. So please take a stab at GitHub pages. Finally, uh, we want to encourage you to purchase a domain name. They're super cheap. Uh, I can't see everyone on camera, but who has a domain name already? Like schmitty.com or kieran.com. 
Okay, here's what you need to do. You need to go this weekend and get your domain name because if you don't, I'm gonna squat on it. And then when you guys turn into billionaires and thousandaires, whatever, uh, you can pay me a lot of money to get it back. So getting a domain is super easy. It's not very expensive. And we'd encourage you to do that because that's like the first step in branding yourself is having kind of your .com or .net or .org, whatever. So please do that. Um, here's a couple of samples, Namecheap, I want my name. <clears throat> and then there's a link to some documentation for linking your personal markwright.com to my GitHub or wherever I want to forward that domain to. Um, it's not too crazy to set that up. Uh, I register all my stuff with GoDaddy just because I did that way back in the day. Um, I'm sure Danica Patrick put a spell on me or something. Uh, but I use GoDaddy. It's pretty simple, but any of these sites are pretty much the same thing. So whatever you want to do with that. I want to stop my screen share. That's all of the readme. And let me open up to questions. Anyone have any questions on? Yep. Or comments. Any instructors? Yeah. I I, wanted to I share this just, too. Yeah. I would just say like um, regarding like the domain name type stuff, like that's like not necessarily priority, right? Uh, you have several months to figure out like what you want your domain name to be and all that kind of stuff. So if you don't get to that over the weekend, that's fine. Um, you'll yeah, definitely a, a bonus. That's why it's the last thing on the list. Get to that at some point. Um, emphasis this weekend. And the thing to think about, right, is that this is what you're going to put on your LinkedIn. Um, you're going to link to this in your Twitter profile. You're going to link to this in your, on your GitHub, right? And so all of this is going to be, this is not now, but at the end of the course, this is going to be the thing that represents you as a developer. Um, and so just thinking about, you know, the things that you need are, you know, you don't necessarily have a portfolio yet, but that you have a section for portfolio, you have like an about me, you know, that kind of stuff. And then making sure you just have like links to GitHub and all that, all that good stuff. Those are like kind of the key, key points here. Cool. Um, I have some pointers or comments, I suppose. So just keep in mind, um, your portfolio page will go through several versions. Okay. So, you know, you're going to find yourself constantly revising things. So don't be too married to one concept because you're going to add more stuff to it. You're going to have more ideas. Maybe there'll be new tech that you want to add, you know, have fun with it. Um, also, um, and I'll ask Cody to confirm with Coach Eric, but at one point later in the course, there may be a like a peer review for your portfolio page. So what that means is a panel of pros will come and look at your page and give you a lot of feedback. Um, and they'll give you really good feedback there too. Uh, whenever that is, it'll, if, if it does happen, it'll be at the end of the course. So, you know, work on your portfolio. We're giving you a weekend to really dive into it. And just during the course, you know, you can update it on your own time if you wish. So that's my two cents. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for that. Uh, any questions about the expectations for the weekend or an approach, how to get started, anything like that? Everyone solid? Yeah, this is cool. It's like, cool. this is, uh, I think you guys should really try and have fun with this. This is an open ended. Yeah. This is like kind of like a mini project, right? Whatever you want to do, like it's up to you. I don't have questions now, but I'm sure as soon as I get started, I'm going to be like, I have questions because this is, it sounds like a really cool project, but I don't know, like, I'm going to have questions, but not right now. I think I should take an art class or something. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, start with wireframes. Think about like, what, what do you want it to look like? Or what do you think you want it to look like, right? And then just start building. There's not gonna be tons of JavaScript in this, right? Like maybe you have click events. Um, so maybe not, right? Cause like ultimately you might just have three HTML pages that just use HREFs to link to each other. Um, and that's do you, do you guys recommend like you're calling it a spa page where it's like all one or do you recommend separate pages? Whatever you want. Yeah. I have no recommendation. 
no one's gonna judge your portfolio site based on whether or not it's a spa. <laughs> like, yeah, it's a portfolio site. As long as it's got your like, as long as it doesn't look like you know your MySpace, it's probably fine. I it, I would encourage you guys uh, if you want my two cents, and I think the instructional team would echo this for every project we do is start super super small. Even if you think you're not pushing yourself, you probably it's going to be more complex than you assume. So, you know, don't try to make some big thing, just start really, really small, something you can scale up. Um, I just put a link into Slack. Uh, it's one of our instructors in DC, uh, Jesse Shaw, who's an amazing developer. Uh, but click on his site. It, it's not super fancy. And I actually appreciate, I, personally, I like like really clean and simple things. I think this speaks to him as a developer. If you talk to him for five minutes, he's very efficient. He's very smart and sharp. Um, but this speaks worlds, speaks volumes about who he is as a person and a developer. So, you know, don't think that it has to be some, you know, crazy design or something. Uh, you know, sometimes less is more. I was looking at that one. I actually tried to go to it. It looks just like a terminal window. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of, it's, it's clever, right? It's just like a little um, similar to when you clicked on, you know, the party time or whatever, uh, the heart, and it, showed you a different version of the site. You know, it's kind of, it's, it's fun, so. Yeah, you should have made it black and green though. My Just black like, and green. Colin, uh, I like love the nasty oh, like the terminal. matrix, yeah. Yeah. I can give you his, uh, his Slack handle, you can hit him up. <laughs> Actually, you could look him up in Slack if you wanted. Uh, Christine, Colin, Cody, any other? Thoughts from the team? Well, Colin shared his portfolio site. So everyone just like bookmark it, you know, put it at the top is like the best site ever, right? Um, yeah, I can share mine too. Um, it's gone through so many facelifts and it's going to go through another one whenever. I don't know. Like the more time you spend on it now, I recommend that because you're going to like forget about it and time's going to go by and call it. And then you look like Colin, you know, there. Um, That's ultimately what happens when time goes by. You just start to look more. Your hair more. grows, yeah. <laughs> I've read articles about that. It's weird. Um, I would also recommend, I think, because we're all, all coming from, like, previous careers, um, as you're creating your portfolio, focus on your web development stuff. I don't care if you have like records in your previous career, maybe you can put that somewhere else in your resume, but you know, companies don't really care about that. They want to see your code. They want to see something that looks intriguing and they want to um, kind of learn more about you. So that's, that's what I would recommend. And again, once you start getting more projects throughout the course, you're going to fill up content. When you graduate, you're going to probably work on all these ideas you want to work on and fill it up. Um, Mark also has a nice one, Mark. You should share yours. <laughs> Did you draw all of this stuff? Yeah, drawing is a little side hobby of mine. That is amazing. Thank you. I have no art skills, so I really appreciate it. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thanks. Yeah, yeah Christine's, I, a, Christine's a great artist for sure. I wanted to go into the Dom on her page, though, and turn the pen the other way around. <laughs> go for it. Hack my site and show me what it looks like. <laughs> Colin, how long ago was uh was your picture? Was that 2013, 2014, something like that. Yeah, that's awesome. <clears throat> got that got that beep swoop, man. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh Cody, any thoughts? Is Cody in the room? Yeah, oh yeah, there you are. Yeah. Do you have any, anything to add? I think you guys covered it all. Um, but I didn't hear what you guys said from the beginning. So I'll just say, uh, yeah, don't, don't spend like an, an inordinate amount of time on it because you're going to change it as you learn more things. You might want to add a front end framework for whatever reason, or like maybe you'll want to do something else. Um, and as you learn more JavaScript libraries and CSS things like bootstrap, you'll probably incorporate that on somewhere in your portfolio. Um, so yeah, it's just something to have fun with and incorporate what you learned this week. That's, that's my opinion. And uh, Coach Eric also confirmed that towards the end, there will be a panel to, to review portfolios. 
Yeah, and that'll this, be great. Um, you're going to practice presenting your portfolio. Um, so you're going to get practice like talking in a professional way, your work. And also they'll give you really good feedback on what they think you should change, um, what they recommend. Um, so enjoy it. Yeah, feedback's always good. Constructive feedback. Um, all right, cool. If there aren't any other questions, let me uh, pass it back to Colin. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, basically for the rest of the time that we have today, um, <laughs> I'd like to just uh, kind of open this up to uh, you guys uh, to go over some uh, JavaScript, uh, JavaScript review. So I personally don't have anything planned. So this is going to be led by you guys. And once you guys have run out of stuff to say, or once it's six o'clock, uh, I'll just let you go. Um, but uh, I know that Alan had a question, wanted to go, wanted a second pass on callbacks. So I'm going to go ahead and start by uh, spending some time talking about callbacks. Sound good? Cool. Okay. What is a callback? Who wants to tell me what a callback is? Well, it's a function that is called by like a click event. That's very specific. Be more general. I don't know if there's, there's a simpler... I think the only case where I've seen it is like clicks or hovers. Yeah. But, okay, so if you were to describe what's happening in that, though, in simple terms. I would say a function inside a function. Close, close. We're getting there. It's not quite a function inside a function, but it's a function getting passed. As a function? As a, what do you mean? As a function. Or as a parameter. That's what it is. As an argument. Argument. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, so yes, we typically see them uh, because we've been focusing on Node. We typically see them in the context of. Let me actually record this too. We typically see them in the context of uh, click events, um, basically any kind of any kind of events in uh, JavaScript, um, but they don't have to be DOM specific. So. I think you guys probably have the most experience with them in the DOM, so I'm just going to do write some callbacks here just in a JavaScript file. So uh, I'm just going to define a function called uh, I don't know, foo. I'm going to keep it simple, and it's just going to console dot log. Okay, and the next function is going to be bar equals a function, and it's going to take one parameter. Now remember, parameters are could be anything, right? Um, but we semantically name it a callback because that makes sense, right? And then we know that the first argument that this function takes is, or the first argument that this function takes is going to be a function. It's a callback. So, okay, here we go. And in order to call the callback, uh, let's do, how do I actually wanna do this? Let me check something really quick. I might have a better way of demonstrating this. Let's go over here. It's a little less confusing. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. I think yeah, I'll just keep going this way. All right, so here what I'm going to do is I'm going to, man, I don't want to do it this way because I don't really have a good way 
of pausing. Let me, let me try something really quick. Okay. Can I specify? Let's see. You had a callback function that you wrote in that assignment that you gave us. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out. Um, I want to be able to, I guess I could probably just type it. Let's see if this works. If I refresh this, is it going to, all right. Um, let me do it. Hey, Mark. Yes. Do you know how to if I if I were to just modify this file how I run it? Um, what tab are you in? Yeah, let me check. I know you can do it, but I've never actually done it before. But I want to do it this way because I want to have the breakpoint. Yeah, let me check. Yeah, it's been a minute since I've used that myself. Oh, Hundra was a. Uh, you know, I'll have that. Yeah. Drops. Yeah. But I didn't, uh, the file, I made it on Autumn and I just looked at it there. And so I thought, yeah, Colin, for, uh, I feel like there should be like a little play arrow no. uh, in the far right hand. Yeah, I don't see that for some reason. So the way that I got it going was just clicking on my board game. So that's how I started it. I don't know any other way up other than that. Yeah, it's weird because I have a play button here. No, I keep clicking it. Yeah, it's weird. Um, I just want to be able to use the debugger. Let me think for one second. Um, Well, maybe you can put it inside like an onload that it runs onload. Yeah. But then when I refresh, I guess I could just, oh, all right. Whatever. I'll just do it this way. And yeah. Uh, where's my JS file? Okay. So. This and I'm gonna do debugger. Okay, so um, refresh this. The console over here. Pull this over here. Okay, get in there. Okay. That was a whole lot of work for nothing. Okay, so we have this function, make this bigger. We have this function called foo. And if I call it, it's just going to console.log foo, right? Uh, all a callback is, is passing a function uh, by reference to an argument. So if I, specify foo and I don't invoke it, right? So when we invoke, we are specifying the parentheses. So if I just hit foo, we're gonna get back the function, the function itself, right? And if we, for whatever reason, wanted to redefine it and say like, for example, 
callback equals foo. Now, both of these functions, foo and callback, are pointing at the exact same function, right? Both are going to console.log foo. Callback is going to console.log foo, and foo is going to console.log foo. OK. So when we utilize callbacks, what we're doing is we're passing a function to another function to be called inside of that place. So if I do, I have my bar function. And if I pass bar the reference to the function foo, and now we're paused in this debugger here, go back to the console. So if I ask, what is callback? Callback inside of this function is this function foo. And so when we invoke callback, we are just going to call whatever function got passed in. Right? So let me step out of this, and we get console.log foo. So let me delete the debugger. OK, so now we're back here. We have foo. We have bar. And so there's no, we, we are not restricted to just passing foo to the function bar, right? So I could do, uh, if I pass bar and I pass foo, we'll get console.log, or we'll get that, that string foo. Um, but we could really define any function, right? Var my name equals a function. So now I have this function, my name, right? And if I invoke it, I get colon. And if I pass colon to bar, or if I pass my name to bar, what is the output going to be? It's going to be colon. Yeah, exactly. It's just going to be, it's going to be colon. It's going to be whatever, whatever we want it to be, right? Um, so like similarly, right, we could define another one. So I'm going to do another one, uh, var add equals a function num1, num2. Right, and so if I invoke this and I do 5, 5, I get 10. Um, actually, now I'm going through this example. I don't know what this is going to be. So if I do bar and I do add five five, yeah, and then it gets confused. So that's a bad example because it errors. Callback is not a function because it's actually ten. Um, so if we modify this and say bar, uh, so if we say num one num two. And then we pass in num1, num2, and then I'm going to define that add function here. So var add equals a function that takes one number and another number, and then console.log is the result of them added together. Right? OK, so if I refresh this, oops. I refresh this, now I have foo, I have add, and I have bar. Uh, what has happened to the bar function? It now takes two numbers in a callback function. It takes two numbers in a callback, which means that this callback is in some way kind of tied, the behavior is now tied to this idea of numbers, right? So even though we can pass any function that we want into this callback, it's really only going to work if we pass something to it that can be added, right? Because it'll just error otherwise. So now we're kind of running into the situation where we have to kind of be thinking about, all right, well, what does the function do and what does it not do, right? So if I now do bar 
five, five, and add, we're going to get 10, right? So five, five, and then the callback, which is the add function. So this is the add function, which is defined right here. And they're passing in five and five in console.log. Um, now, in these, in these types of examples, it's like, why on earth would you want to do this, right? Um, and you can start to see a little bit how it's beneficial when you have, like, we had another one called, like, subtract, right? Uh, let me just do this. Let copy it. Why is everything broken? Okay. So I'm just doing var subtract stupid Sierra. I'm just breaking all my stuff. Function num one, num two, and then this time we're gonna console.log. Um, one minus num two. Right, so now we have kind of, we have one function that's kind of in charge of performing, of taking in any kind of, any kind of math function, right? And now, so it might be better to say that this is actually uh, like perform math. So now we have this nice little perform math function where whatever number we pass, we pass in five and 10 and we pass in subtract. It's gonna you know, subtract those numbers. Um, now, of course, we can obviously write this and write like a perform math function that's like, you know, uh, if a string subtract is pass in, then subtract the numbers. But then what happens is we end up having this really long function, right? So we did that, we might have a, uh, I'm just gonna pseudocode this a little bit, but we might have, you know, num, num one, num two, and then operation. And then it's like, if operation equals subtract, then subtract the numbers. Right, and then else if op equals add, then go ahead and add them, right? And you can start to see how suddenly, like more often than not, if statements, like if they're longer than, uh, if an if statement is longer than, <laughs> four or five ifs, it probably means you're doing, trying to do too much. That's kind of a, a, a good rule of thumb, right? So if you think about this, we wanted to, if we wanted to add, subtract, multiply, divide, and we also wanted to square root and do this other thing, we could have this one giant function with a huge if else statement in it, or we could write five little functions, right? And just pass them in as callbacks. And when we get into like server code and stuff like that, it, this becomes really important from us from the standpoint of asynchronicity, where imagine in that perform math function, it needed to run some like really long thing before actually adding the code, right? Something else needed to happen. And because JavaScript kind of works in this procedural way, we want to kind of be able to call back to it once some other thing is done. Um, and we'll also actually on, when are we coming, pro covering promises, Matt, Mark, on Tuesday? Uh, yeah. Monday of week. Monday of seven. next week. Week seven. Uh, week, week after, yeah. yeah. Next week's express, yeah. Yeah. Um, so in a little bit, we're also going to cover uh, a, another kind of more advanced way of dealing with uh, asynchronicity in code, which are called promises. Basically, the idea is that I'll just talk about asynchronicity. What the hell? Um, asynchronicity is basically what happens when you're at McDonald's, more or less. Uh, you're at McDonald's, 
you uh, want to get a burger, uh, but obviously it's not ready yet, so they give you a receipt, right, with a number on it. And you wait, uh, but it doesn't stop the entire queue, right? Other stuff can keep happening while the people at McDonald's are making your burger and someone else steps up and gets, you know, orders their food and they get a number and they get a number and they get a number. And all of these other operations are happening. They're adding, they're exchanging money. There's change being given. People are getting mad. It's totally cool. And then your burger's done and they call your number. They call back to it, right? And you step up and you're like, okay, cool. Where's my burger? And you get it and you move on. And that whole process is happening. And that's ultimately what, a, what asynchronicity is in code, except instead of hamburgers, it's like, data from your database or parsing something that's coming from a third party API, right? And you're having to do something and something some other process is waiting for the result to finish before it can perform. But you don't want to like, you don't want your page to just be sitting and spinning for five minutes while you like do something, right? Or even for like a second, right? One, one or two seconds and, you know, screen time seems like really slow. If it takes three seconds to load a web page, that's really slow. That's like you going, oh, my internet is so bad, right? That's three seconds, more like less than that. Uh, it's really, it does not take very much to piss people off about their internet. So anyway, that's callbacks and asynchronicity. What else, what else do you guys wanna talk about? Or questions about any of that also? Any, any part of that you wanna talk about more? That helps, thank you. That's good, good, glad it helps. Um, besides, yeah. I guess, server-side scripting, is there a case where maybe like something we've already been working on could have been done with that and we just avoided it because it was more advanced than we were ready? Yeah. I mean, you could use, you could use callbacks for, yeah, for any of your game logic, right? I mean, and you were using them for your click events, but you could say, I'm trying to think. Um, like, okay, so in your game, it's like not necessarily, because there's just like not really anything happening that's taking a long time. Um, but for example, like imagine your blackjack game was a real blackjack game. And when you bet money, it didn't just like take it from a betting pool, but deducted it from your bin. Okay, um, so it's only really used when stuff would take a long time. It's a time, it's always almost like nine times out of 10, it's a timing issue. How yeah. can we use that with click events then? Because that the seems like something that would be instant. I uh, don't know, no, no. but see, but with click events, it is a timing thing. It's not, you're not wait, you're, the long process that you're waiting for is for a user to click on you. <laughs> sitting, oh, okay. sitting there waiting to so be- So it's like polling? Polling, like in what context? What do you mean by polling? Uh, different languages. Never mind. Can I interject? Uh, I, I think a good example of using uh, JavaScript or something is um, I don't know if we covered set timeout, but I think that's like an asynchronous type of ideology where let's say we have a set timeout for the button to activate an event in uh, one second, right? You click the button at one second at t equals zero, let's say, and then you click it again at t equals two. But then you can also click it at t equals three or any infinite time in between then, right? But then um, the commands will happen at different instances, you know? So it's like, um, uh, kind of like Ace in that, in that manner. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that would be another example. Um, like if you, okay, so in Connect4, you say you uh, click the bottom circle for Connect4 and you decided to do like an animation so the, Div at the top, like slides slowly down to the bottom. I tried that. Yeah. With that same function. Okay. So if you did that, while that's happening, nothing else can really happen, right? Because it's like, so what might happen is if you did that and then you clicked another one, it would be kind of sitting in the queue waiting. And once that finished, then the next one's going to come down. And then the next one's going to. So if you clicked like five in a row really quickly. Um, that's kind of a weird example actually in that that's- Yeah, my, my problem was that it'll, I have to also clear the color. So it'll go, I wanted to use gray. 
Mm -hmm. and stop at the, the first time that it was red or yellow. It'll go gray. So at first, I had it super fast in a for loop, so I couldn't even see it. So I just removed the white one. And yes, it's been gray, but they were stay that way. And then I tried to do the like time set out or whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. It'll take so long that it, in my for loop was too fast for it. So it'll only like catch like one of those or something like that. It was like everything was breaking because I shouldn't have used the for loop, but I didn't know how to access every single um, value in that row. Yeah. How long you, I mean. You'd have to do it via for loop or you'd have to index it and use like a matrix. So it's like stored in a hash table. I, I wanted, I didn't know how to slow down my for loop. Like how do I make it go slower? You have to do like a set timeout in each one just to like pause it <laughs> say like wait one second each time it iterates or wait a quarter of a second each time it iterates so it like just stops and does nothing for a second so this is one reason why set timeout is kind of a weird example in that the whole point of callbacks is to get around the blocking nature of javascript and set timeout and stuff like that are actively blocking you can't do anything else while set timeout is happening um and then stuff happens after so set timeout wouldn't work with callback. It does. I mean, it takes a callback. But what's weird about set timeout is that unlike kind of the reason why you'd use callbacks in the context of like fetching data from a database where you want other stuff to be able to happen while, while the data is still coming in, the set timeout is working in the opposite way in that it's going to run the callback once three seconds have gone by, but nothing else can happen in the in the inter in the interim so it's the same concept it's just like re reversed a little bit um, okay but basically like moral of the story is that callbacks are there to kind of manage the fact that stuff doesn't happen instantaneously um we'll be doing callbacks like all the freaking time um and they'll become it'll become second nature um because initially the callbacks that we use in Express next week are, they're just, it's, it's just part of the syntax. Like you just write the callback in and then basically it's just waiting for an HTTP request and then it calls the function and then sends a response back. Um, but. Cool. Other questions? Can you give us an example of the two while loop? Just a quick refresher. Yeah. A do while loop. Okay. Oh, cool, Mark. You're still recording. I don't even need to be recording. desktop yeah so we have two different ways of writing um, writing while loops in JavaScript right so let me actually comment all this out so we have two different ways of writing while loops um, one is just like while like 10 is less than, blah, let's say var i equals 10. And we say while i is less than, uh, is greater than zero, console.log. So what this is going to do, and then actually we also need to i minus minus, right? So we decrement. So, okay. So every time this loops, um, what's going to happen is, let's see if my paste is working now. Nope. So sad. So if I refresh this, so we get, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, the idea of a do while loop is that 
this needs to evaluate to true uh, first in order for this to run. So the do while is in opposition to that. So do, uh, do you need a block for this? Yeah. Do, and then if we say i plus equals one, I'm gonna reset i to zero. This out. So do i plus equals one, and then if we say, uh, I'll just console.log i, console.log i, and then do this while i is less than five. Right? Or we'll do 10, so let's just keep it. So the idea here, the difference between these two is this one is going to evaluate, is i greater than zero? And then console.log and then decrement. This one is going to increment console.log and then check whether or not i is less than 10. So it's just kind of in reverse order. Um, and got my parentheses. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, so it includes the, the ten. Yeah, exactly. Because it goes one more. Huh? So it goes. It, it does. checks that last, uh, um, and then then when it sees that it's like didn't meet the expression, then it cancels out. Yeah. So it's not necessarily. Yeah, it's going one more because it doesn't know when it runs this. It doesn't know that i is less than ten yet, right? Because it's not or you're not checking that. You're saying only, only cancel this after the code in the block has run. Run the block, then evaluate whether or not it's true. This one is evaluate if it's true, then run the block. Questions on, questions on that? Uh, while loops and do while loops, uh, you will probably not use for the rest of this class. <laughs> And like their, uh, their uses are very specific to the type of logic that we're doing in those games. And if you choose to do a game at some point, then you'll probably use while loops. Um, obviously like real video games use like a very, very complex while loop. Uh, Node is a giant while loop, but obviously a very, very complex while loop that's constantly listed thing for like, are there functions? Is there like a thing happening, right? It's the event loop. Um, I, yeah, I can't imagine you, and you might, you might use a while loop for like, you might, might come up in like a code, uh, like a, a code wars challenge or something like that. But in terms of like the type of coding that we do in express or in angular and that type of stuff, you're like not ever going to use a while loop or more likely than not. I've never written a while loop professionally. Have you, for Mark? No. For loops, yeah, all the freaking time. For loops, sorry. Yeah, for loops, for loops and for each for sure. I can't really think of a ready instance of the while. Yeah, yeah. And looping over, looping over objects. Those are that's pretty pretty ubiquitous because you uh, all. One thing you guys are going to learn next week is that, and you know, one thing if you're not if you're unsure of it, you might want to bone up on looping over objects because we will loop over many, many objects for the rest of this class. It's a huge part of, that's like how data is, sent, is in JavaScript objects or in a, in a notation that looks similar. Um, so there's lots of that. But while loops, yeah, I don't, I don't think I've ever written a while loop apart from Apart from prepping you guys for Blackjack and Connect4 and stuff. That's you, you may have mentioned it, but it's really easy to screw up a while loop and make it an infinite, infinite loop. Yeah, it's super easy. So that's, that's bad stuff. Yeah, I definitely had tried to implement one into my Blackjack game, but it, it crashed it because it just went on infinitely. Yeah. yeah and actually, uh, uh, Alejandro, that is like in your, you're talking about how your fans started going, like in your for loop. Basically, what was happening is it got confused, and because it was reassigning, it was in an, in an infinite loop, 
Exactly. And so your computer is just like. I, I found that out when I was going through the brake points. I, I remember you put a brake point, you put it on the side, but it was going, I told you, it was like the array was at like 62 and it only has 42. So it was, I knew that it was wrong. Yeah. Cool. Uh, what else? Yeah, Andre. Speaking of if loops, I feel like I understand it, but I, um, but I sometimes still get confused about the difference between if else versus if else if. Yeah. So I, I get if else, but for some reason if if else if seems to break whenever I try to use it. Okay. So the big thing with if statements, um, so a couple things. Uh, one, you don't have to count that out. All right, so let's see. Uh, I'm just gonna use like true and false just for the sake of pseudocode, but you can, so if statements take an expression inside of parentheses. So if true, run this block of code. And I'll just do a comment. Run the code in this block. And if you only have um, one thing to check, you can just leave it at that, right? You can also write it in this niftier way, which is if true, uh, now I'm forgetting, let me try it. If true, I think you can just write it without parentheses. If true, console.log. That's not quite it. Is it without the, that? With this? So you can write single line if statements and they're kind of cool. There we go. So you can do that. That's kind of some sweet, sweet little syntactic sugar, right? So we can also write this like this. If true, run this code. Um, this is specifically single line. Doesn't work in any other context. All right. Okay. So if else, so if we did, if we had a couple things to check for, so if A is true, do this thing. And then if we did else, do this other thing. So this is if A is true, do this. If A is anything other than true, right? So false, i.e. false, do this. And so this is like an implicit thing. So if 47 to 49, if this does not pass, then perform 49 to 51, regardless of what happened, right? It uh, doesn't matter what A is or what it is not, but if it is false in any way, then if it is not true, then perform this bit. Um, else if requires a, an expression. So you're, what you're asking in if else is like, if uh, A equals the string A, console.log A, Else if, oops, let me close this. Then parentheses, oops. Uh, else if expression A is uh, equal to B console.log B. And then finally, else doesn't take anything and just is like, if A is neither A or B, then else uh, console.log see, see, I feel like when I get to that kind of level, I'm just like, I'm just gonna case switch it because every time I try that, it seems like that is the else if part right there is a yes. part that always trips me up for some reason. Okay. Yeah, I mean, case statements are totally legit. I mean, use case statements if they make more sense to you. That's totally fine. 
case statements are sweet. <laughs> but I mean, they're perf it do it's doing the same thing. Like if you wanted to write case statements instead. But basically the logic that's happening in here is we're saying, check this first. Mm -hmm. Then check this. And if it's neither of those, do this as a fail safe. So just in the train of thought and trying to ask questions out loud, mm -hmm. if else is pretty much, it's, it's like you said, it's really this big, this big true or false kind of situation going on. Case switch is not looking for a true or false, it's looking for matches. But it's still checking, it's still, ch it's checking for matches, but it's still, uh, you don't see the true or falseness of it. Um, it's like less explicit, but it's still checking like, Underneath, it's still doing a true-false evaluation. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you know, like the. Uh, oop, I didn't mean to turn the screenshot off. Uh, let me look at the pull up the uh, case statement JS documentation. Let me pull it up on MDN. Uh, the um, case statements have switch statements. Switch statements have like the same, um, so slow. Switch statements have a similar, uh, a similar logic to them, right? And you can think about it very similarly. You're saying switch, this is your first if, and all of these are basically else ifs. If the expression is this, else if it's value two, else if it's value n, and then your default is just your else. Else, if none of these other things are true, then finally just do this default thing. So, you know, one thing to maybe figure out your if else logic would be to just kind of, because they're performing the same thing, would be to just think about like if you can match what's happening in the case statement and the switch statement with the if else statement, that might like kind of clarify it because you don't you, you kind of don't necessarily have that initial if they're all basically else ifs and then you have an else at the very end in that default block let me pull that up one more time i'll show you so we have uh we have our expression so the thing that we're checking and then our case so else if expression is value one else if expression is value two else if expression is value you know whatever and then finally default else, do this other stuff. So statement takes you with none of the values match the value of the expression, right? So everything else is false. So don't, don't check anything else and just do this. And often defaults or else's will be errors, right? Because it wasn't any of the things you expected or were checking for, so it must be something wrong, right? Uh, so if you're checking for like numbers and it happened to be like you passed in a string, Right, and you are always checking for numbers, and it's like, is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Okay, well, it's none of those, so it must be something else. Uh, and you're muted. I would always look at switches, and and I'm not sure if this is the correct way to think of it, but um, I think a switch is like a switch. So if something happens, then look for these things to see if that happened, and if these things happen, then do this other thing. Yeah, yeah, that's oh. right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And like I said, uh, you know, if you want to use case or switch statements all the time, go nuts. Uh, switch statements are great. You probably want to learn the if statement at some point. But <laughs> it's not working it. just default to the switch statements. That's, that's legit. I think I got it. I think my problem was, as you were saying, even as well, is that my is my else if, I think I was forgetting to make sure that that's still checking for a true value. Yeah. So in my mind, I think I was mixing the two up and expecting it to run because the first one didn't run. Yeah. And it's like, no, oh, it needs to be true just the same way as the first one needs to be true. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, remembering that else if, if and else if take expressions, so that code in the parentheses, and else doesn't take an expression. Then it'll error if you try to, right? And that's probably what's happening, is it's like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's not how I work. Cool, these are good stuff. What else? You guys have anything else?
Going once, going twice. And chat, 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 chat. Everybody, chat, 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 chat. All right, guys. Um, cool. So you guys know what you got to do for this weekend. Um, have fun with it. Don't stress. This isn't like we're not looking for like perfect portfolio sites. Um, you guys don't have like all the pieces yet to build it. Like you don't necessarily have your resume fully built out. You don't necessarily have your domain name built out. You don't have, you only have one thing to put in your portfolio. That's fine. Um, this is a way to exercise all of the HTML and CSS you guys have been working on this week and doing it in the context of something that you are personally creating and not like, Hey, make, uh, this dog with hats thing or remake Brooklyn. It's a really hip pop-up shop. Right. All right, guys, uh, you're free to go. We'll see you Monday. 10 a.m. Bye, you guys. Have a great weekend. Bye. 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 <laughs> Good boy. Bye.